Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, Worker messed up my yard and didn't do what he was supposed to. I fired him. For some background, I acquired a house roughly five years ago, and it flooded three times in that duration. In the 40 years prior, it never flooded. Thank you, Global Warming. After the third flood, my wife and I were finally able to sell the house for a loss and move out. After much searching, we located our ideal home. Or so we believed. We discovered something quite strange after around six months of living in the new home. The toilets wouldn't flush, and the bathtub would fill with sewage whenever it rained a lot. So we gave a plumber a call. Our sewer lines between the house and the city sewer line were broken, the fantastic plumbers informed us. And although we could attempt a patch job, we would most likely have to replace the entire line. Hurt. We advised trying to keep it as inexpensive as possible because we had just lost money on the old house and invested a lot of money on the new one. Where the line was broken, they excavated. Broken is a strong word. The line had practically disappeared. The entire line would need to be replaced, some around $5,000. Not the ideal moment, but all right, let's go ahead. These plumbers called me after they had done their best to expose the line. The location of the residential line's tap, where it connects to the city line, is inaccessible due to the severe breakage in the line. The residential line is now the homeowner's responsibility, but the tap and the main line are the city's. As the plumber, I do what's necessary. He replies that in order to find the tap, we must obtain the city plans and dig. More money equals more digging. I just want to poop in my own place and take a shower at this point. Two weeks have passed. Now, they excavate the hole. Digging a four foot by four foot by ten foot hole, they discover nothing. We verified the city's blueprints twice, and the tap is located exactly where they state it should be. We now have the city to contend with. As instructed, we dial 311, and after three hours of waiting on hold, a city employee emails us the identical drawings that show the site of our excavation. We say, we already dug there, and there is no tap, when we return the call. After a day of vacation spent waiting for someone and not getting far with the city, my wife finally makes her way down to City Hall to meet with an official, Richard, as we will name him. Richard prints off the same blueprints that we had previously received and instructs us to dig where indicated. With a, look, it's not there kind of expression, my spouse pulls out her phone. He mutters to himself at this point, pulls out a pen, and marks the actual place on the drawings. It's approximately 10 feet west of the original site and displays the residential line dog-legging from the original designs. He clearly doesn't want to spend any of his precious, cushy government job time with my wife. He had clearly cooked up something to get her out of his office. The plumbers arrive, excavate a second 4 foot by 4 foot by 10 foot hole, read more money, and to their amazement, the tap is also missing. How fun. Once again, a wasted vacation day was spent waiting for Richard in City Hall. We need someone from the city to come out and designate the location of this stupid tap. We don't need any more hand-drawn maps at this point. When they emerge, I use one of my vacation days to wait for them. To their credit, they dug a little deeper into the sewer and marked a new location between the two large holes. Finally, a real place. The plumbers emerge and excavate a third hole. Furthermore, you would be foolish to believe that they had actually located the tap. By now, the backyard is completely wrecked. The place is damaged and there are mounds of dirt everywhere, and the trees and lawn are completely lifeless. The backyard of our lovely new home is basically garbage. 
We are furious and have lost yet another vacation day. Let's head back to Richard's office. We don't lose our cool, but we're certain that we couldn't have been connected to the city's main line. The tap was not there. How could we have been unaware of this, you ask? What just piled up in your backyard after six months of sewage? Large dirt mound in the backyard that was skillfully groomed to create a forest? Plenty of space to hold the sewage produced by just two persons. However, in the event of heavy rain, the wet soil would refill the bathtub and prevent the toilets from flushing. Although Richard doesn't take accountability, he does send out the contractor who handled all of the tap installation into my neighborhood. When the contractor exits, I hear the whole tale. The main sewer line was fixed two years ago when the previous owner was doing modifications and was not residing in the home. Essentially, they enter each home and install new taps after sliding the new tubing beneath the old tubing. They inform the city that they did not service our house since they were unable to enter the backyard because no one was residing there. I'm enraged. Richard's laziness prevented him from doing his job and making the necessary calls to the contractor to resolve the issue resulting in three months, over $20,000, lost time, and vacation days. Now, recall how I had three floods in my first house? I learned my lesson about dealing with individuals, and we documented everything as soon as we realized that we needed to speak with the city. I recorded the contractor explaining everything on camera and every conversation, including emails and phone calls was obtained lawfully in my state. Recording requires the approval of both parties. I take my first shower in three months at my residence after he installs a tap. I'm all set to go. I descend to Richard's office once more. I want to submit a claim and show him everything. Since it's my obligation, I agree to pay for the residential line. Nevertheless, I would prefer that the city refund me for the expense of excavating the superfluous holes. Seems like I have a pretty strong case here. As required by our city, we had to submit three written estimates along with a claim form before beginning any work. Richard immediately refuted the assertion because none of that was done and could not be done after the fact. I'm left speechless and feel totally defeated. I phone my wife and am reminded that I have some lawyer pals, so I, I cheer up a bit on the way home. Any one of them, or someone they know, could probably help. I had no idea that my state possessed sovereign immunity. Richard is aware that, in essence, he can attempt to sue the state or the city, but that the lawsuit will be quickly dismissed. Since they understand that I would be squandering my money, no reputable attorney would assist me in pursuing my lawsuit. I'm essentially on my own. I have conceded failure after phoning for about months in an attempt to find someone who could assist. A year and a half passes. I have no idea at this point how I'm going to pay back the debts I took out when they start to come due. We've cut off all contact with Richard and his office. I've also tried crickets and his boss. Richard wouldn't meet with me when I tried to go back down there so I make a desperate attempt to contact my council member at last. I provide all of the evidence I have with a summary. I have low expectations. I push submit, and an hour later, my phone rings. My council member is here, and she is furious with the way we were handled. Later this week, she's supposed to meet with the chief of public works. She claims that she would fight for me until they kick her out of the building but she makes no promises. She gives me a call on her way back to the office following the meeting. The public works chief has taken full responsibility for the situation. She demands all of the receipts, everything from the plumber to the pay stubs that documented our vacation, phone logs of our time spent waiting, the price from the landscaper to fix the backyard, etc. By the time she returns to her workplace, they are all in her email. It was roughly three weeks ago. I had a meeting in my council member's office yesterday. Me. Many thanks for that. You've given us so much, and my wife and I are unable to repay you. It was my pleasure, she said.
We converse briefly. Her. This is a check for what you are owed. Me. This is fantastic. We can pay off the loan and get our backyard finally fixed. Hold on. This is way more than we require. Her. You neglected to include emotional distress. For you? I included it. Oh, and because Richard's no longer employed there, you won't have to bother about resolving any problems with him. Simply come to me. The head of public works and I are pretty close buddies now. Me. Oh my gosh. You're the best person I know. Please, let me help in any way I can. Her. Maybe you could come out and vote in the upcoming elections in the fall. After paying for everything, I returned home, and the landscaper is where it will be arriving the following week. And I'm helping out with her re-election campaign. Edit. To set the record straight, I volunteered to pay my share, $5,000, and was merely requesting the additional work to be completed because they neglected to install a tap of about $15,000. Richard didn't go for it, so I dismissed him and paid about $30,000 for the additional labor, the time and energy my wife and I put in, as well as emotional suffering. Vote for this female counselor if you can, because she deserves it. She evolved into a sort of angelic protector for you. We very likely wouldn't be facing half the issues we are now if we had more elected officials with the caliber, the qualities of this councilwoman. Make this woman the mayor, dang it. Vote for her. <laughs> Contact the newspaper, whatever. She seriously deserves some praise for this and some amazing press. After all, she deserves to be rewarded for her generosity and integrity. People despise public employees because of people like Richard. Unless his attitude drastically changes, I really hope this lazy POS never gets a job again. Dishonest employees who don't perform their duties like that are just the absolute worst. I'm beyond happy for you that you prevailed in the end. The world is not without good people. and. This stands to show that fact. The next story is, HOA destroys my yard, my property, for a reason unknown to me. They find me, but I am not a part of the HOA. In 2022, I bought myself a completely new barn house, which was built to maximize my connection with nature and to become one with everything that happens amongst the lush greenery that surrounds my house. At first sight, I fell in love with this house and realized that it was the perfect option to become my home. The only thing I didn't like was the fence, so I built a new one. As you can imagine, everything was perfect with the house, but not with the community that lived with me in the neighborhood. A little bit of context. My house was located in a so-called gray zone, and technically it was not part of the neighborhood managed by the HOA. But there are several properties around my house that are managed by this HOA. So that you understand, living next to this HOA is like living next to a layer of snakes that don't treat you very well at all. This HOA is notorious for destroying other people's property without permission. They don't care that this property is called private for a reason. I heard a lot of different information about this HOA in the local media, so I was very happy that I was lucky not to be a part of it but I still tuned in to the fact that sometimes my peaceful atmosphere could be destroyed by some Karens from this HOA, but I tried not to think about it. I realized that I am not a very responsible person in this regard, but it so happens that I sometimes forget to check my mailbox. This happens often, but in 95% of situations, I don't get anything important in there anyway. But it just so happened that the HOA sent me fines without saying anything. They didn't give me any verbal warnings. Nothing. Just a fine that I ignored because I just didn't look in the mailbox. By the time I looked in the mailbox, I had already collected so many fines that I could not count them on one hand. The HOA was constantly fining me, and it got to the point where one morning, I woke up to the sound of heavy machinery destroying my new fence, my private property, and just my yard. My beautiful oak tree was being cut down. My custom-made fence, which cost me a lot of money, was being torn apart. I immediately ran to these workers, 
demanding an explanation. They handed me a notice from the HOA saying that they were just a company hired by the HOA and that I should just leave them alone. I was beyond furious. I never signed any agreement with the HOA, and no agreement would give them the right to destroy my property anyhow. I called the police, but they were powerless in this situation. The HOA showed them some incomprehensible documents that looked official enough for these policemen, so they didn't even intervene. Revenge is a dish that's best served legally. With the help of a lawyer, we got the original deeds, which proved that my house was not part of the HOA. Never had been. I also kept an old note from the HOA, and I also had many witnesses. On the day of the trial, the HOA thought they would definitely win. They didn't know that I had also hired a private detective who found many cases where they had also acted illegally. The judge's expression said it all. In this case, only the HOA lost, and everyone who suffered from them got something. The HOA lost a total of half a million dollars. I rebuilt everything and learned two things. Never underestimate the power of a good legal advisor or detective, and always defend your honest position. The next story is, IT jerk being mean to me in the internet. I will not let this go. I spent some time as a member of the U.S. Coast Guard. I was transferred to a unit with a lot of IT technicians about 10 years ago. As was customary, I spent the most of the first year of a four-year tour qualifying. We were in charge of numerous systems and a big area of responsibility. Overall, the excursion was very enjoyable. But about year 2.5, a fresh group of technicians arrived to take the place of the departing ones. Good, eager to learn and grow in their careers, most of them. Names have been changed here, and unless you work there and know everything about it, the location should be sufficiently mysterious. Two were notable for different reasons. Nate was a good technician, an excellent noser and the favorite child, so it went straight to his head. Carl came from another service as a transfer. Carl was sacked from his IT job and went on to work as a cook in order to keep his job. He worked as said chef for a minimum of six years prior to entering the CG as an IT lateral. A little bit of an a-hole, socially uncomfortable, nice nonetheless. Nate assumed the persona of a mean-spirited office smart butt. A bully, if you could envision one in a military setting, for the job. Carl was a simple mark. I also did, being a competent programmer but lacking in political acumen and social graces. Many difficult jobs that Carl and others had messed up went to me. In addition, I had a talent for diffusing angry customers' situations while completing tasks. Nate was a talented artist, and one of his hobbies was drawing caricatures of different coworkers. He drew stuff that people could find offensive, but mostly were thick-skinned military guys and thought it was humorous. But one of the worst things Nate did, in my opinion, was to get me into trouble during his lengthy training break-in phase, earning me a cold shoulder for life. He was my break-in since I was the week's qualified technician. According to store policy, a break-in might use the duty phone for the duration of the weekend and call a qualified technician if the issue couldn't be resolved or when it was fixed. He turned off the phone because he was sick of taking calls, refused to answer any phones, including his home and personal phones. This resulted in my command calling me one Saturday night out of the blue, chief of the store. Why did you not answer the duty call? Me. Oh, chief. Nate had phone duty and hadn't informed me of any issues. What's going on? Chief. Get over there. We guarantee a 30-minute call response time and a three-hour on-site response. After two and a half hours, this location has still not received a call back. Proceed and mend the transmitter. I make sure to notify the command center to contact my personal cell directly, as I don't have touch with the guy who has the duty cell. I get at the place within the allotted time and fix the broken gear. When Monday arrives, due to Tuesday being duty swap day, I'm dragged into the chief's office to defend my actions. 
Yes. Ultimately, it is my job to respond to calls of duty. Nonetheless, it was shop policy for the duty tech to answer the first few calls before alerting the qualified tech. Since I had no real control over the situation, I just received a verbal warning, but someone who was qualified ought to be chastised. Joe? He received a slap on the wrist and was dragged into the office. Since people's lives were essentially in jeopardy and these radio circuits and equipment are used for identifying and relaying marine distress signals, if it had been me or anybody else, it would have been persecuted as a dereliction of duty. Nate started to have it out for me after I questioned his integrity. Apart from that, nothing significant happened until I moved to my next unit. Carl gives me a call instead of sending me an email, which was customary when a former colleague wished to be in touch. As it happened, Nate had been more proficient. He opted to join a different federal service after letting his term of service expire. Using his terrible MS Paint abilities, he attached a picture of Carl to an obscene news article and mailed it to all of his buddies who were still serving in the military. I acquired a copy too, but Carl destroyed it. Since none of them wanted Nate to get into trouble, they all permanently removed it as well. It turns out, he did one for me, too. He connected a picture of me to a news piece from three years ago when I was re-enlisting, with the subject line of, Uh-oh, what did Sniker77 do now? He mailed it to all of his friends. Carl received a copy and thought it was awful enough to notify me. So I got a copy from him. If anything like this got into the wrong hands and was exaggerated, it could easily ruin a career. I manually copied the URL from the altered image into my browser to make sure that it wasn't a hoax. I then proceeded to inform them of this prankster's attempt to conduct a practical joke. Now the retaliation begins. Legal, HR, and the HR of the new agency Nate works for receive my story, evidence, and research from my boss, the chief, whose boss, the W3 warrant, whose boss, the LCDR. Thankfully, they had a local HR representative in the building where I worked, albeit for a different department, and I've been informed that it's being taken care of and is not in my control, so don't worry. After three weeks, I receive a hurried email from Nate, expressing his regret for his actions. He clarifies that it was a joke and expresses hope that no one took this joke too seriously. I'm sorry if I offended you, but please accept my apologies if others took it too literally. The former employees he had mailed it to call me at least three times a few days later, requesting that I rescind my complaint. It transpires that he edited the picture on his brand new work computer. Using government equipment improperly? Verify. Attempted defamation of a federal worker? Verify. There were also a few more thrown in there and his employment was subject to revision. During the three months of his probation in late October, just in time for the holidays, together with a new kid, and they released him. I had no choice but to tell these guys that I had no control over the situation and that I had not personally submitted a complaint. Severe justice? Perhaps, but nothing that his vicious behavior hadn't earned him. Not exactly the results of his activities, which were justifiable, but his actual actions kind of bothered me. It's not like he was just young and still in this stage of acceptable immaturity. It kind of bothers me that there's something about adults that causes you to lose professionalism and maturity. Never look back and regret what you did. In any case, it's a worthwhile experience, and... Maybe he'll emerge from it with a more responsible personality. Everyone occasionally needs a kick in the pants, especially when they need to think outside of themselves. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder subscribe, like, and comment.